Hey, this is Next Meridian. We are Nick and Mathilde and we left everything behind to travel the world with our Land Rover Defender Albatross. Three years, seven continents, 88 countries, and just the road as a home. This week is a different kind of episode. It's longer and it's not about traveling in a bird. But it's a super interesting story. So bear with us and meet Paul and Oliver. We left the last episode as we were jumping on a bus from Hamburg to Paris after dropping our car in the port of Hamburg to be shipped to Canada. Immediately after, we dropped our luggages in Paris and hopped in a train to Angers. Angers, French town, territory of castle, cute villages, all of this along the Loire River. This is where our friends Paul and Oliver settled just a few months back. They are embarking on the adventure of a lifetime, launching a permaculture farm. Working with them this week was a journey in itself. Just like us, they quit their jobs. Just like us, they changed radically their lifestyle. But while we completely unrooted ourselves, they were doing exactly the opposite rooting themselves in the land. It is only the beginning of their project and they are only in the design phase. But we didn't know anything about permaculture. So we were really here to discover the project, understand permaculture and help them with a few tasks. Project at the Bois Pilet, <laughs> using his French name because we don't have an English name. Bois Pilet is all the way over here. Okay. So this is your farm. And that's the pond. Mm -hmm. That's the pond and your whole farmland is this yeah, area. Yeah, this area right here. So this is where you and live. With the wood. And right now we're going to cross the, the forest. Okay, And cool. we're going to go down to the Bois Pilet. Okay. Let's do it. Yeah, super cool. Now we're on the farmland. So Oliver, Paul, Mathilde on the right. And this is the house. <laughs> they told us Oh yeah, you'll see, it's pretty cool. We already have your room set up and everything. <laughs> oh man, okay, that's gonna be a lot of work. And so they have this whole field uh, for themselves. And now they're building also the road because um, yeah, trucks have to come and bring material. Can you read it? Can I read it? Yeah, making plants for one year, we plant rice. Making plants for 10 years, we plant trees. Making plants for 100 years, we prepare people. Selected by Oliver Brooks. Old Chinese saying. Old Chinese saying, yeah. And the more I see like what climate change does, the more I'm like, I can't just leave things like this. Um, I need to help the land to protect itself and to become like more, you know, stronger and more resilient. And there's a lot of permaculture techniques that help you do that. Um, and so my wish and my hope is that like in five, six, ten years time, like this land will be able to cope with like massive floods, massive droughts and still have life, still have biodiversity, still have deers hopping everywhere and not have like, you know, a burnt out like field and not have a wet, soggy field like. So that's 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 like, I really hope that this thing will stay and that um, we can probably expand it, hopefully, like towards other part of the land. What part of the farm and the project are you most excited about? Um, I'm really excited about um, creating a healthy soil on on the fields that we that we've uh, acquired because um, we've done some tests and it's not looking good right now um, it's highly compacted very anaerobic acidic and so part of our project is to restore the soil life on on the, the property mm. and that is gonna take years I'm scared that um, things won't come out as we planned because it's a long way from design to 
practical achievement. And what we're doing is experimental. So although there's a lot of great literature about what we're trying to do, um, it isn't proven by science. And I think that's my biggest fear. So what we're doing is really trying to get some practical uh, anecdotal kind of evidence that this is uh, an effective way to make food. Mm. And um, I want to learn that for myself to see if it's true or not. Just to give you a uh, quick background story to what's happening here. I've lived in China in the past and uh, Oliver also was there. We went to the same school together. It was uh, middle school. And uh, a few years back, he met Paul. I think it was maybe five or six years ago. Uh, anyways, fast forward all that. And um, now about six months ago, they moved in here. So, this so let's introduce our protagonists. Paul is French New Zealandese and grew up in the region of Anjou, where the video takes place. Previously, she worked at the French consulate in Shanghai for the economic cooperation between China and France. All of that while getting a permaculture certification and completing a yoga teacher accreditation. Because, you know, why not? Oliver is Belgian-American. He was raised mostly in China, so he speaks fluent Mandarin. He had numerous previous lives, including teaching farming to kids in the USA, working for a startup in Paris, and acting as a tourist guy in Shanghai. Those two met in China and always knew farming was something they wanted to give a try at. They moved back to France, seized the opportunity of an available land to work on, and here they are, with 50 acres of land, a pile of rooms they call home, and all ready to start. Okay, so hi, my name is Paul. I'm 27 years old this year. I was born in France, but uh, my mom is from New Zealand, so I consider myself half French, half New Zealand. I grew up here in the countryside, but I was lucky enough to live in China for nearly five years. So I call that my second home. And I just moved back to France from Shanghai, where I was living last year with my boyfriend, Oliver, and we moved back to start this new permaculture project. What does it mean for you to become a farmer? What does that mean? Hmm. I think it means for me, I thought about this question before, not in like a formal way, but in a very personal way. It's kind of a way for me to formalize uh, how attached I am to the land, because I've always felt very at ease outside, you know, planting things, driving a tractor. I always felt like it was my place to be, but it was very hard to assume that like uh, personal kind of feeling in a world where, you know, you have to study, you have to get a corporate career and everything. So being a farmer for me is a way to like reconcile myself like inside with how I feel with being outside, you know. It's also like a recognition towards all the people who've worked the land before us. And I really feel like there's a lot of, in France, in, there's a lot of countries, but in France especially where like farmers are either not recognized enough or they aren't, let's say, put forward the way they should be because their role is so important in society and I think a lot of us when we live in big cities we forget we forget what a farmer is and how hard they work so yeah I also want to like be a proud farmer you know I want to be like a proud woman farmer um, I think Paul's greatest asset is the human contact that she has with others and her ability to put others at ease and to create trust and that's a very important aspect of living a rural life is to be able to trust your neighbors and to rely on them. Uh, it's not at all something that I learned in the city. And so I think that's Paul's greatest asset. Is there something you need to learn from scratch? Or is this uh... something you don't need to learn from scratch? <laughs> Everything? <laughs> Everything. Everything. The only thing I know how to do at this point is drive a tractor. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. My name's Oliver. I am American and Belgian from my parents. Um, 
I lived previously in China before moving to France um, and um, getting this project started with Paul since November of 2021. Being a farmer is more of, a, of an ideal for me. I don't think I've reached it yet, but um, you know, that's where I'm heading. My first experience with farming or growing food um, would have been joining a community garden. Everywhere I went in my life, um, whether it's the US or France or China, always managed to find a community garden. And we met some really interesting people, some people who mentored us, especially in Shanghai, where we lived in China. When I, when I worked in Seattle for six months as a gardener, and honestly, day to day, it was the best job I've ever had um, because it's so free and so creative and it's so like unforgiving, like nature doesn't lie. So if you forget to do something like water your plants or I don't know, weed your garden, nature doesn't care. It's just gonna take over. Okay, uh, Oliver is a great problem solver. Um, he'll see something, like an issue we have, he'll think about it, he'll think about it for a while or, or not, and he'll start doing something. Sometimes he doesn't even tell me, he just starts to fix the problem, <laughs> and I'm like, hmm, like, how did you think of that? And uh. then he's like, oh, it's common sense, blah, 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 and then I'm like, oh, well, I didn't never, never think of that. So yeah, he's a great problem solver. The first step in our project is to um, design all of the water systems on the land. Um, that means storing water as high as possible on the property um, and reducing evaporation. So getting the water to soak into the ground. That's number one of uh, permaculture when you assess a site of uh, you know that you're going to design is water so the first thing you look at is like what water is there what's the topography of the land the shape of it and like what are the predominant winds where does the rain come from so the one interesting thing is that um, there's a s two streams that actually flow in a V uh, from west to east in this direction so we can like deduce from the water flows and the low point here because there's a lot of water that the water flows like this more or less mm. so here what we have is like a line that's at 34 meters above sea level and then here we see that it's a this is like satellite data that we get from a special website 31 meters at the pond here and then 28 meters here mm. so the one thing that you learn in uh water is going that way exactly but that in permaculture is that water flows uh, like at a per like 90 degree angle to contour so that means that the contour lines like this your water is going to flow ah. like 90 degree angle so basically like i've been working a lot on a whole map of ir the irrigation and like the water systems of the farm um because our teacher jeff lawton like he has a farm in Z in australia called zaytuna that has a whole network of like i think he has more than 20 dams so they're like big ponds and swales that are like canals like connecting all the different ponds and he has a I think a little bit more land than here, but this land, we could do exactly the same thing in a different way, but we could have a network of ponds and dams that would be like amazing. Yeah. And so I, and I can't wait to like set that up. But yeah, you said there's a lot of water. Yeah, there's a lot of water here, but actually there's less water than 10 years ago. So I think the, the nap phreatic, so the aquifer, mm. I think the aquifer levels went down. Okay. But you're going to build that. Yeah, we're going to build it up. Uh, this is the <gasps> pond. <laughs> so it's a real pond. It's a real pond. You have the little green things on top. And there's a... Um, a but it's huge. It's a, there's a spring. There's a spring in the pond. Okay. Somewhere. So the higher part of the land is this part. And the water naturally flows like this way. 
So because you don't want the water to flow downhill, you're going to make a ditch that's going to be along that line. Mm. And you're going to make a little bump here to be sure that the water won't go through the yeah. ditch downhill. And so that concept is important because it's not used in conventional agriculture. But it's a great way to he rehydrate the soil. Mm. When you have like loads of fields that don't have any drainage, the water just erodes. It just mm. goes downhill and it leaves the property. But if you do this, you're actually helping the underground so like reservoir to come up. So this is our like idea of uh, what kind of swale we would implement on the property. So it's not exactly on contour because as you've like noticed, the contour data we have are very like approximate. It's like one big line of 34 here, one big line of 31 here. But when you're on the site, it's actually different. There's mm. a lot more subtleties. So we designed this according to what we observed instead of satellite data. Because mm. satellite data is not as precise as like what we see. I don't know, but it's like a huge dip in the field. Okay. It's like a huge hole like this. You want to create one of the ponds over yeah. there? Yeah, we'd love to make a huge pond here. Yeah, that would be mm. cool. And so there's no point in the water going directly like that because yeah. that means it will go out faster yeah. to a low point. So we're like, okay, let's make it do a detour as much as we can. And then the overflow, because in a swale, of course it overflows since it stagnates. You need an area for it to go. We're like, okay, then it'll overflow in this massive pond that we'll create. That would be cool. And then, yeah, and it'll be a natural pond. And you can see it here. Oh, you see it? Yeah, well, the quality is kind of But basically, here is dry. Here yeah. is green because it's lower. Mm. So interesting. So it's huge. Like, this is the pond. Yeah, this is really big. This is a huge thing. Like, it's really big. So that's a wow. mini low point. Where is the pond? The pond, the dip is here. You can see the difference. Yeah, it's of level. Light green. Here it's we are actually in the pond here, no? Yeah, we're actually in the pond, yeah. Because we see that it's higher all the time. Number two is being able to access all of our site uh, using the least amount of road possible. <laughs> we haven't done much gardening no. uh, since we started our project because we have to start everything from scratch. We don't even, we didn't even have a way to drive into the site uh, earlier this year. So we had to, you know, and it's so infuriating because y you you want to get away from driving and using your car, but the first thing you have to do to to be successful is to like make a path for your car. So yeah, then the second thing we have to work on in permaculture is access. So access, this is the basic version that we did. Um, it's basically like the road that we started to do. So instead of using the traditional road that goes down south, we decided to make the road go north. Because you want to do the ditch also? Yeah, we want to have a ditch like, I mean, ideally that goes all along the road. So like it will catch the water because water is, ro a road is a flat surface. So the water will like come off really easily of the road. It won't mm -hmm. soak. So it's best to harvest that water. And it's also nicer to go like behind the house because in front of the house, you get a, if you get a lot of cars and everything, mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's not very nice. Nice. It's <laughs> what we call in French récup. Récup. For. <laughs> for. Collecting unwanted materials. And right now they have tons of material they don't use, but Oliver and Paul want it all for their new farm. So that's what we're doing. There we go. So all these trash that you might think is trash, for them it's gold. Right? Yeah. Yeah, for them it's gold. Trash is gold. God damn. All right, let's do it. Look how fast come out. This is what we gotta do. Pick up all the bricks we can to build the road. I like watching you work. This is good. Good job, man. All right, fill it up for me. <laughs> so this is a new road they're building. It'll be faster and we got to smash it. Yeah. Just to make it easier. <laughs> I don't know, to drive on? Why, why are we breaking it? Yeah, so that the pieces like go sink into the ground easier. 
Nice. Then if it's just a big flat piece, it won't work as well. Who wants to join us? What do you think? I think they're all roads need roads. <laughs> How much more is needed? Uh, this is like, I think it still needs uh, pretty much the same equivalent. Okay. Like another 200 meters? Yeah, another 150 meters. 150? Uh, Bye. Bye. And number three is building a house for Paul and myself. Then the last part is structures. So that's like the third kind of main thing you think about when you look at a property. And structures, like we started to work on what was existing, so the central first like layer here that we put house, like we called it house, kitchen, bedroom, bathroom. Um, then we added here, I added like just for the sake of the design, a rain tank because you have to take into account that you need to harvest all the rainwater. So, so this is the Cadastre Napoléonien from 1812. You have like, a cool. huge thing here. The barn probably wasn't built, and then you have like this odd building here. And this but it's so cool. So the runes that you have on the side of the house is like totally was totally a huge building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I found documents from the family archive that say that in 1946 there were over 200 square meters, 200 square meters of uh, bâtiment habitable. There was like a poulailler. There was like a deux hangars, une étable, une ferme. A four a pain, all of that. Yeah, it was an entire farm. Yeah, it was an entire farm. So, but there's no map, so I can't exactly know where. So I did some research on the pictures. Um, this is kind of cool. This is like from 1949. So you have wow. the grange here, and this is like the old building. How yeah. did you find it? On a website called IGN, and ah. it's like um, an old like French website that it's like public data, but it's all the satellite, not satellite. This is like Argentique airplane pictures. Wow, yeah. Yeah. so cool. So we're going to remove everything that is on the, on the roof. Yes. Okay, cool. We'll be starting probably on this side because so there's a bit, just wash your feet, there might be some holes. Yeah. This side already has like a couple of uh, poutres that are, are like pieces of wood, beams that have been taken off. Okay. So, and then there's the other room here. So cool. Oh, and I'll show you the archeological ar expedition. This is an old, like, uh, barn room. Yeah. It was entirely covered in vegetation. Like, the vegetation went all the way up here. So the whole thing was, like, a forest. Barn house? I mean, the old farmhouse, actually. The whole thing here? The whole thing here is the runes. And so we've been excavating it. And what we discovered recently is... Um, a skeleton. There's, yes, I wish. There's a wall here. Yeah. And it goes all the way to the back. And so this will help us to determine how big the old house was and we'll be able to rebuild following the like... But how much of a priority is that? That's like in the medium long term. Like is it... Const uh... Constructible? Yeah. No, so this is why we need... You need to find this. Yeah. Bringing coffee to the working site. <laughs> C'est trop bien. So On est bien là. I am currently excavating the old wall, trying to find whether it's still existing or if it's demolished underneath this pile of rocks. You can see the wall all along here. It probably continues to the edge of the pile. And that will be useful because we'll be able to prove that there used to be a, a house here and that we can build on it. We can build according to what was already built before. No. Because this is farming land, so you're not allowed to build new houses here. But you can build according to whatever existed before. So this is probably 250 years old, but it's still here. We're going to start taking the slates off the roof. Um, this part of the roof is the west side, so the dominant wind comes here. That's why it's more damaged. Good job. Oh, 
how to dismantle a roof by Mathilde. Ah ouais? Hydrating the workers. Very important. <laughs> yeah. Good job for the day. Especially Mathilde being up there completely in the sun all day. Yeah. What are you doing all day? Picking up. So Mathilde's just dropping everything here yeah. and then Paul's picking it up and sending it away. Huh? This is the result. We're probably going to stop here because this wall is falling and so we don't want to walk on it. And all of this is rotten, so it threatens to fall any minute. So we got the big chunk out. We're going to do some cleaning with everything that fell off. Once you've looked at water access structures, you look at the um, energy flows, sector maps. So it's basically analyzing the dominant winds, the sun angles, um, the water, and any other thing you, you want to keep, like the view or like a nasty mm. smell coming from your neighbor who has like a cow or a like duck farm or something. So here we have the summer angle of the sun that's really wide then mm. here you have the winter angle of the sun Dang, so that's cool when yeah, you position so nice. your windows and you position your doors like you can take this into account where like maximum windows like in the winter sun of course less windows in the summer sun so mm. you don't get like too much is uh the summer wind so that's hot winds winter wind is the blue one this is the really cold wind i was telling you about mm. no protection here like it's just no trees nothing <clears throat> and in purple so it's, you want to put trees yeah so I'll, you'll see in the final design, but the idea is to like basically create a sun trap where everything up north that is cold and wet is treed, like forested, and everything in the south will be open. So it will be like nice and cool air and then like nice little sunny part here. This is the next concept in permaculture. Um, you look at <clears throat> the concept of zoning. So that means like you'll look at your central point of activity where you are every day. And according to that, you will determine the area that you go most frequently, mm. like every day, and you'll look at how many times you go there. So for example here, how many times do we go from the kitchen to here, mm. compared to how many times do we go from the kitchen to the horse field. field. Yeah. And so according to that, you're going to place items that need to be frequently or not frequently seen Where? in those zones. Okay. So you use that as a framework of like, okay, I need to go see my horses every two days, so it can be medium far away. But I need to go see my rabbit every day, so my rabbit needs to be really close. So zone zero will be inside the house and maybe one or two meters outside the house. Where you are most of the time, most of the day. And this is where you like navigate a lot, in and out all the time. Zone one is your immediate like first garden. So if you look out here, um, the terrace will be stopped here. Here we're like full south. So it's where you grow like most of your aromatic herbs, your like cherry tomatoes, all those things. So it'll be in front of the house and also on the west side of the house um, because we'll have a view to the pond. So all of this area is within maybe 10 meters, 10 meters of your house. Then you have zone two. Zone two is like more like main crops. So it's like 20, 30 meters away from the house. So you don't go, you can go there maybe once a day, but you don't go there like multiple times a day. Zone three would be like maybe 40, 50 meters away from the house. And that will be like pastures for horses and donkeys and maybe sheep. Um, it will be also fruit tree area. And so those are the places you go maybe a couple of times a week, but you don't have to go there every day. So it would be around there? Yeah, so zone three would be all in the front here. Um, also at the back over there, like where the pond starts, but it's very vague. Like for now, we're just like doing it per distance. We kind of did a radius, like a circle around the house. And then we just kind of calculated according to that. And zone two, like the pond, for example, would be in zone three. And then behind the pond, just behind the house, between zone two, we'll have all the chickens and ducks over there. And then you have zone four. And zone four is um, basically where we're gonna plant all of our like uh, 
firewood trees. So that's where you go and like cut your firewood. So only go there like maybe once a month or a couple times a year. We can also have like cattle there. So big pastures further away, go there once a week, once a month. Um, so that's like, yeah, cows, I don't know, more horses if you have like large flocks of horses or whatever. And then you have zone five and zone five is entirely wild. You only go there maybe once a year to walk around. It's the place where you learn from nature. So that would be like the forests, uh, the ponds down there, uh, all the corners where we can't get to um, will be left alone in the wild. That's really going to be the next two, three years of our lives is just getting those things right. And it's a really big responsibility because it involves sometimes big machines and making permanent changes to the land. And um, we're really like beginners at this. So I'm sure things are going to go terribly wrong at some point, but it's going to be fun. And maybe you guys can like <laughs> document that <laughs> in two years <laughs> next time <laughs> next time we have a, a water flooding situation or I don't know infestation of some kind no yeah are you scared yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah I am uh, yeah I am but in a good way um, but yeah, I'm scared. I'm like, holy cow, you know, <laughs> uh, how is this going to work? Like so many things to think about. But then I think of like why I'm doing it. And I, whenever I have doubts or like moments of like total crisis, I'm like, I just breathe and I remind myself like, why am I doing this? And then I'm like, okay, it's the right decision. It's fine. It's all going to be fine. My grandmother would always say that when you finish building a house, um, that's kind of like the least fun part of the project. The project is always better when it's still like ongoing. So even though it's hard work, I always think to myself that um, this is the best time. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> no, it does. <laughs> what a week. Despite our choices bringing us to very different directions, we feel very close to Paul and Oliver's life phase, in that, that it entails a drastic change of lifestyle. We are very glad we had the chance to learn next and wisdom, and we hope to see the farm develop and thrive as they wish in the following months and years. They are always looking for like-minded people to tag along and share experiences. So do not hesitate to recommend interesting initiatives in the comment section. They do not have any social media for the farm just yet, but we will share with you as soon as I do. Next week, we get news from Alvatrus on its way to Canada. Subscribe to the channel to be sure you don't miss the next episode. See you next week! Hey, cheers. Cheers. side steering wheel. English style. Let's see how he does. Kind of want to bring the seat forward, but I don't know how. Ugh. Look at those legs. <laughs> Wearing a swimming suit. <laughs> oh god. Yeah, this one has more power. <laughs> <laughs>